Guten Morgen. Herzlich willkommen in der Heinrich Böll A warm welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I'm uh, Mrs. Siemens, uh, Simons, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second day of the conference Monopoly in Africa. Last night, we already had the kick off meeting where Barbara Unmüsig and Carlos Lopez, the professor in Cape Town in Oxford, gave a keynote speech. Today, we are also having a very interesting program. We have many presenters, but very much in brief, for those of you who were not here yesterday, we are in the midst of the so-called Africa year of the German government. Africa was not in the focus before of the German government, the chancellor. And for a long time, Africa hasn't been so present in the German media like in 2007. In the framework of the G20 presidency, the chancellor made Africa its focus. The Marshall Plan with Africa was presented. The financial ministry developed a compact with Africa and Last, the Ministry for the Economy initiated the initiative Pro-Africa. In June, there will be an Africa summit in Berlin, and then there will be the G20 summit. In November, there will be the EU-Africa summit. There are differences, but two initiatives are in the focus, investments and migration. Often these two aspects are considered together. When you read between the lines, you will see that economic cooperation and investments are seen as a strategy to prevent people from leaving Africa to go to Europe. Initiatives and summits are plentiful. The uh, German government had already has already been criticized quite a lot. Uh, well, we, one could criticize the different papers, but we do not want to do initiative bashing here. What we want to do is what to find out what our African partners want when it comes to investment and sustainable development on the African continent, what kind of investments and investments regulations are desirable? How can sustainable jobs be created, but not at any cost? What approaches will help to have a sustainable economic development? Despite the hype about Africa in Germany, the perspectives of African partners are hardly to be seen. And when African perspectives are included, the question is, whose perspectives are they? The African governments are one player. The private economy is another one. And the African civil society is hardly heard. This is why I'm very pleased to welcome our African presenters. We are very pleased to have so many guests from Nigeria, Cameroon, Kenya, South Africa, and Guinea-Bissau. We are very pleased that you will share your expertise and your perspectives from business, the civil society, uh, politicians with regard to sustainable development. Please give all our presenters a warm welcome. You all know the program in print or on your uh, mobiles. 
there are very interesting panels. Let us start with a introduction into the Africa policy of the G20. Then we will have a reality check. We will listen to a discussion between the architect of the compact with Africa and a leading Kenyan economic expert. We ask what commitment is desirable, and then we will ask what does this mean for German politicians and business. Before we start, one housekeeping remark. There are other events going on here, so it may be a bit crowded. Lunch and coffee will be served on the crowd floor uh, at the reception where you registered, please return on in time, on time in the uh, uh, for the panels. Well, there only remains one thing for me to do: to thank everybody, especially the Africa team and all the other development uh, departments who participated in the preparation. And I wish all of us an interesting day, hoping that we will have many take-home messages with regard to sustainable investments in Africa. Now I give the floor to Nancy Alexander. She leads the economic governance program of the Bell Foundation in Washington. Nancy, you've got the floor. such a great meeting, and I look forward to meeting so many of you. Um, my um, presentation includes a lot of slides, and, and you don't need to try to write down the information because I will give you, I will send you my slides if you're, if you're interested. I just want to say two uh, opening comments, which is that I have worked um, kind of against World Bank policies being imposed on Africa and other uh, regions for an amazing 30 years. And so I thank Barbara Unmesig here, our president, for coming to me uh, about eight years ago and saying, Nancy, would you be interested in following a group of 20? And I just sort of scratched my head. I didn't know what would come of it. And indeed, it's led me somewhat more deeply into uh, work on Africa in particular. And my passion about um, the African reality was really born um, of two things. Number one, uh, when I began working on development, the World Bank and the IMF did not release any of their documents, and so we would get documents about Ghana, documents about Kenya, documents about countries, and we would send them to the people in the country saying, you know, we, we, we stole these documents for you um, about the investment plans of the World Bank and the plans of the IMF. And then I formed my own organization and led it for a decade fighting water privatization, forced water privatization around Africa. So I have worked on infrastructure for, for many years and just want to share a few of my uh, perspectives and hope to learn from you. Um, and someone please give me the, the message when I have five minutes left. I think I have 20 minutes, but please give me a message when I have five minutes. Um, I was relieved last night when Carlos, Lo Carlos Lopez said that colonialism is not over because there is still PETA, the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa. And indeed, that's the thesis of my comments today, that colonialism is not over. 
and from billions to trillions, big money is being promised to African leaders uh, for a new age of mega projects in Africa. The African uh, Development Bank and the African leaders have developed these five uh, pledges to power Africa, integrate it, uh, feed, I don't like saying feed Africa, Africa can feed itself, um, infrastructure and improving the quality of life, but there's this alternative colonial agenda you know, that says, look at all these resources uh, you know, from iron ore to, um, to, to copper, to nickel, to um, oil and gas. There's this alternative narrative that very much plays into the theme of this meeting of monopoly in Africa, outsiders playing the game to get access to uh, resources and markets. So the program for infrastructure development in Africa, let me give you some facts about it. It runs in four sectors, energy, water, transportation, and information and communication technology. And it would appear that the motives are not uh, really sustainable development, although that's what's talked about a lot. Um, China. Um, has announced that its, you know, its Belt Road Initiative will connect to Eastern Africa. And then two weeks ago, Japan announced that it was teaming up with India to have an infrastructure initiative in Eastern Africa. The U.S. has its own initiatives, but the U.S. is pretty disabled right now. Um, but the thing is, you know, since World War II, China's GDP has quadrupled as a share of global GDP. Uh, so, you know, the U.S. Is, has, has shrunk. And so the World Bank Group says that, wow, people can earn a lot, 4.5 billion people at, that are poor, but these are worth $5 trillion. So they want, the outsiders want the markets, they want the natural resources, and uh, I look forward to your correcting me if you have a different perspective. PETA is African owned. And so it was interesting when Carlos last night said African leaders have to fight for Africa um, for their own people because, you know, here's the energy map of PETA. All the projects are already designed. And um, when I first showed this, I've shown these maps all over Africa, or at least in Accra, Nairobi, uh, Joburg, elsewhere. Um, often people were working on a project, but they didn't realize it was part of a master plan. But this is the master plan for energy. This is the master plan for transportation. And remember, those of you that were here last night, remember Carlos talking about the infrastructure being around the coasts, meaning that they're looking at global sourcing to a greater extent than they're looking for intra-Africa trade. Intra-Africa trade is very low. Intra-Africa investment is very low. Um, this is the water master plan, um, and again, the, they got the leaders of Africa, and especially corporations that form the Continental Business Network. There's a Continental Business Network for Africa that have a plan. If I have time, I'll tell you about it. But they got very anxious because they were, you know, saying, you know, we need more money. We need to get these projects off the ground. There's too much risk and investors won't come in. So we need uh, champions. So there's a Presidential Infrastructure Champions Initiative, PC, that champions the projects that you see here on the board, so uh, on the screen. So in Nigeria, 
you know, did Buhari really want the Nigeria-Algeria pipeline to serve the gas customers in Europe? Was that really his first priority? I ask you, maybe. Um, in, in Kenya, you know, Lapset, which Ikal is going to share her experience with, is the, the number one presidential champions initiative for, uh, for that country. Um, so these are the ones chosen by presidents. And as we all said, as Barbara said so clearly last night, Africa needs economic and social infrastructure. So there's nothing wrong with really holding that goal up. Uh, but what's wrong is that the PETA, that I'm Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, gives priorities to these mega projects that will crowd out all these other priorities, and it gives priority to public-private partnerships, which I'll say something about later. So PETA doesn't help, or at least maybe I can be corrected, it does not seem to help too much with urban infrastructure, intra-Africa infrastructure, industry, social infrastructure. It's unclear whether it moves us towards the Paris Agreement's uh, co uh, commitments. And it certainly doesn't involve civil society, because in all my travels, civil society doesn't have any input that I know of to the strategy. So the goal of the paradigm, I'll make a couple of points about it, is to for states to make contracts with private investors that ensure big revenue streams. So they standardize uh, PPPs in order to rec replicate them. They contract project preparation. Um, and they allocate risk in a way that is very unfair, as I'll describe. So you know, you have a road, you have a contract, and that contract turns the road into a stream of revenue, a stream of money that will flow to investors who are very frequently not in Africa. So it extracts resources very significantly from Africa. And PPPs are controversial. I'd like to ask, is this a picture of a duck or a rabbit? You know, because the public-private partnership appears to be a wonderful thing to some people, especially investors, and a terrible thing to others. In truth, the evidence shows that PPPs would significantly privatize gains and socialize losses. And we can talk about that if there's the time. Um, all of the evidence that I've collected from all kinds of studies, I have a list of them here, show that you know the institutions, the investors have no idea what happens to sustainable development or poverty. They either have no idea, or as the last point says, they they are so dangerous that they pose a reputational risk to the lenders. This is not good news. But African presidents and leaders are looking for short-term gains, and they see a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And they tempt African leadership, saying, you know, instead of these small official development assistance amounts only like 135 billion, we will bring trillions to the shores of Africa. But can you get there from here with mega, giga, terra, million, billion, trillion dollar projects and a deregulated uh, environment? Can you really reach sustainable development and climate goals? The billions to trillions scheme was announced two years ago as the way to achieve the sustainable development goals. And it was announced by seven multilateral development banks and the IMF. So there's a lot of weight behind this. And um, I think that was my last slide. I'll just end with saying that this mil billions to trillions scheme 
I was talking to Carlos about it after the session last night, and I said, it's scary to me that the dream of the World Bank president is for the people who pay user fees and uh, tolls for roads, user fees for education and health, they in fact would support the pensioners in the North if the pension funds of the North, and there are $30 trillion in pension funds in the North, $30 trillion, and the Continental Business Network of Africa is arranging to bring these pension funds to Africa. And to me, this is the ultimate human rights insult, that in fact, so much is lost from Africa in the form of debt service, in the form of illicit outflows, uh, of, in corruption, in uh, intellectual property right, royalties, all these streams are extracted from Africa so that Africa is a net provider of capital to the rich countries. Most people think we give aid to Africa, but Africa gives aid to the North, and this is not understood. So when we talk about a contract for or with Africa, that's a starting point. How can we stop all the robbery from Africa? And this plan from billions to trillions could be another such scheme that would take the resources of Africa in order to support the pension funds and the insurance companies in the North that are all in crisis. Why are they in crisis? Remember last night they talked about zero interest rates or negative interest rates so the pension funds and the insurance companies could go bankrupt. They could go bankrupt unless they find a source of revenue. But looking to extract it for generations, these contracts go for generations from Africa is the wrong way to go. And I don't have time to talk about it, but the foundation has a special project to confront the G20 and confront the World Bank group with their draft contract because they've given every government in Africa a draft contract that would put most of the risk for infrastructure development on the governments and the taxpayers and the consumers of Africa and most of the gains in the hands of the consumers. So I have five minutes left. That is so exciting because I really want to hear whether you think I'm right or whether I need some serious correction. So someone speak up, uh, either you know a, a correction or a question or a comment. Uh, five minutes. If I've stunned you all into. Well, thank you. I always go over time, and people can't stop me from talking, so this is wonderful. But if you have nothing to say, I'll be really disappointed. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe it. No questions or comments. What have I done wrong? Maybe I can be more stimulating um, in my remaining time. Martin? So maybe we'll have time for Martin and Dina. Uh, the rest of you were bored. Th thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Thank uh -huh. you for the presentation. Don't worry, we don't have anything to correct here because you are so much right in what you present. And I think we should follow you and go deeper into the discussion. I think that's what we have in the program. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll take off some of the things that you've just said. Thank you again. Well, I'm sure Martin speaks for everyone when he says nothing I said was wrong. Dina? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Hi, thanks. I found it very, very interesting. I just had uh, two little questions, really. One, could you, you mentioned the Continental Business Network for Africa. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Who, who's in it, where, where they come from, what they're doing, what they have done, what they plan, uh, how it fits into this whole um, picture? And second, do you have, um, 
Do you, ha do you have any ideas for alternatives? For different what? Alternatives, different ways to go about building the infrastructure that is needed, but that would be doing it in a really just and fair way. Well, um, yeah, the Continental Business Network used to be called the World Economic Forum PETA um, Advisory Group. And it's made up of banks and huge transnational corporations. And so, for instance, the presidents of Africa, the leadership of Africa, historically has met with the PETA World Economic Forum business group to make decisions about cross-border infrastructure. And in terms of, and now it's called, I think, the Continental Business Network, and their primary goal is to get northern pension funds and insurance funds to invest in these. And when I talked to a pension fund manager um, at the Think 20, I said, what do you think about the president of the World Bank's dream, you know, to have users in Africa, you know, supporting old people in the north? And she said, well, isn't it great that the people in Dar es Salaam, they get a road? Isn't that great? And I said, well, OK. They have a road that they would not otherwise get. But for how many generations should Tanzanians or other Africans pay the old people of the north for their road? These contracts could go 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So for how many generations should, should Africa pay of its blood, sweat, and tears? Um, so it's now the Continental Business Network, uh, apparently, that seems to have taken the place of the, the other network. Um, and you can find um, the, its plan on the website. With regard to alternatives, um, there are a lot of NGOs that are opposed to mega projects and opposed to public-private partnerships. I'm not, okay? In the United States, I can get on a plane in Washington and I can fly anywhere, except there's no direct flight to Berlin, but I can, <laughs> I can fly anywhere. You know, I can take railroads, although we're eliminating our railroad budget. Um, but there is a really significant um, intra-regional mega project uh, network in many parts of the world, and Africa should have one too. The problem comes in really so many areas, but I'll start with the cross-border infrastructure should be, first of all, connecting Africans to each other instead of connecting Africans to the world, because if Africa wants to do agro-processing, do value-added manufacturing. It needs to have infrastructure for its own needs, and it needs to, in my humble opinion, but I stand to be corrected, you know, serve markets that are local and regional. But this plan is a plan designed by outsiders that want access, primarily, not exclusively, um, to Africa's resources and markets. And then secondly, there should be implicit sustainable development goals. But do you know the G20 and the World Bank and the Asian Bank, the AIB, they have no definition of sustainable infrastructure, none. There is no definition. But they could at least say, OK, African countries made commitments in Paris. They made commitments to the Sustainable Development Goals, including resilient infrastructure. So we are going to work with leaders and citizens to design infrastructure that meets those goals. They have failed. They have failed to do that. But Dina, the most important point to me is that everything is cloaked in secrecy. It's the way it was 30 years ago, where you can't get copies of the loans, you cannot get a copy of a public-private partnership contract. The foundation is creating a partnership 
with Transparency International and the Open Contracting Initiative in order to push leaders. But here, you know, we really can't do it without more Africans. And, you know, we really look for African partners that can provide leadership. We should not be in the forefront as a German or a North American initiative. We're really interlopers, you know. So please, if you think this is a worthwhile initiative to push, number one, transparency in um, loans, transparency in contracts, transparency in the specific project, the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, because the last point, Dina, is that these mega projects are so expensive and you know although african debt is only 42 percent of its gdp is rising very 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 quickly for lots of reasons we could talk about these mega projects have to be understood in terms of the trade-offs that exist between pain for mega projects that may cost billions of dollars and do you know one mega project ecol and others can tell you this one mega project may be made up of 500 sub projects you know so they're a maze and so unless we can deal with trade-offs the, the last point i'll make because i'm trying to stop talking is that um once I was on a business call with the World Economic Forum and the heads of PETA about the north-south corridor um, in um, east, southern, uh, southeast Af Africa. And so I said to them, um, so how much planning has gone into making this corridor connect with small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa? And the project leader for the North-South Corridor said, I remember someone from Africa, someone from Tanzania raising that issue several months ago, but I can't remember how it was resolved. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know, if we're not supporting African enterprise with mega projects, um, what are we really doing? Um, we're caring only about the scramble and the contest and the monopoly game. And we need to put that in the past. We need to put, as Carlos said, that brand of economic colonialism in the past. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. This introduction, um, you know, with all the talk about investment in Africa currently going on on the level of bilateral cooperation, G20, the EU, for the most part, the talk remains very abstract. And we actually really need to go into what does this mean? So what does it mean when we hear about macroeconomic stability, when we hear about investment-friendly climate, when we hear about public-private partnerships? You brought it up financing models for investment, bankable projects, as you said, and so on and so forth. So Nancy, you already went into this question, uh, and we are going to continue on the next panel. Uh, so I, I want to ask Martin, Ikal, and Uwe to come up on stage for the first of our panels today. So as I said, in this panel, we really try to go into the nitty gritty. So when we hear about all these things, what do we actually mean? So what do investment, most importantly, 
investment projects in infrastructure look like? What does it mean on the ground? What is happening before an investment project is decided upon, during implementation, and after? Who decides on it? Who pays for it? Who benefits in what ways? And this is what we're going to discuss here. So I'm very happy to have three panelists on stage. Ikal, welcome. Ikal is the executive director of Friends of Lake Turkana, a grassroots activist with an interest in environmental justice and resource governance policy and practice. She works towards an increasing participation of grassroots groups and local communities in governance of resources and decision-making processes. She's concerned with ways of sustainable management in order to increase the livelihoods of rural populations. Ikal is pursuing her PhD with an interest in the livelihood transformations and socio-ecological conflicts that have been generated by the oil exploitation in the Lake Turkana region. So welcome, Mikael, on stage. <laughs> Martin is the general representative of the Africa Development Interchange Network, ADIN, an organization with special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council and leading consultant for the Bureau of Economic, Technical and Commercial Studies in Cameroon. Furthermore, Martin is the former chair of the Commonwealth Foundation Civil Society Advisory Committee, and he's an expert in financing for development and lecturer in the field of project management and planning and international participatory monitoring and evaluation. He holds a PhD in economics and business management from the University of Yaoundé, Cameroon, and his recent publications focus on Chinese investment in Cameroon. Welcome, Martin. Last but not least, Uwe Kegeritz is Development Policy Spokesman of the Parliamentary Group of the Green Party and member of the Committee on Economic Cooperation and Development in the Parliament. In 1990, he joined the Green Party, and since 2009, he is member of Germany's federal parliament. Prior to his political career, he worked several years as a self-employed corporate consultant, as a freelance teacher for public and private institutions, and advisor for professional rehabilitation. And he has also spent some time in Cameroon with the German Development Service. Welcome on stage, Uwe. So as I said, uh, let's get very concrete. So let me jump right into it. Ikal, what are your experiences with investment projects? You work a lot on infrastructure investment in the Lake Turkana region of East Africa. So what is happening there? Can you give us an impression of what investment in this region actually means? Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, I think coming from, from the Lake Trukana region, which is marginalized, as, as, as I can say, with uh, education facilities being provided by the Catholic diocese, um, everything that's there is, is supported mainly by the Catholic diocese or by NGOs. We, we see the, the recent, and it's not, it didn't start long ago, the recent need to put private investment in the area. So you're looking at the electric kind of wind power, which is, which is highlighted as the largest wind farm in Africa. And so there's a lot of push for it. Um, you found the former UNEP director um, was, was always you know, trying to get more funding for it. Um, then on the other side, you see the, the hydroelectric power that's being pushed for, again, but this time it's transboundary between Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, with again the drive mostly from external uh, forces saying that we, you know, green energy, and so you're seeing the two sides, which again are both green, green energy projects, but then the one lack of participation, the lack of consideration of free prime from consent, because this is again within indigenous communities, and and all of this is one state owned and the other is private public partnership, but then all this is happening whether it's private public partnership, it is happening on community lands. And, and territories. And so we then start to say, where are the owners of the land where you're putting up all these projects, especially when it is purported for, pu for public good? And in, in many cases, even the Kenyans themselves, so if, if you're generating power, the consumers of the power do not know you're generating how much power and at what cost. So then are we then just creating more spaces for corruption in, in all this? Because until the consumer knows what 
if you're saying you're ne it's needed for the Kenyan population, for Kenyan businessmen, what is the cost of this power, and is it cheaper to to source other uh, you know other sources of power? So we keep asking this these questions within the two major projects, and now further on now it's going into the oil sector again. A lot of lack of transparency, as as Nancy said, all this infrastructure we're going to be putting up a pipeline, a large a pi pipeline to get the oil from Turkana to Lamu. We have we don't even if you compare to places like Nigeria, we can't even say we have oil. So you build a pipeline, 25 years later you have no oil. What do you do with the pipeline? So we want a lot of questions generated from all these large infrastructural pushes to then be able to, to ask ourselves, is there return on investment on this? What is the cost of this power that we are generating? What is the impact on the population whose lands and territories are being affected? But also, is there a pub clear transparency around all this pro projects? And what is the interconnectedness to the actual pr producers? Because if you generate power, and I lose my livelihood of, of fishing, how, what am I going to do with the power? Yet, all this power that's being generated is being transferred to the main grid, which then serves the urban population. So the people who've actually lost a livelihood have lost a livelihood, don't benefit from the power, yet pay for the power through a tax of a, of a livelihood that they cannot generate. You say you keep asking these questions and bringing up these issues. How, how do you do that? Like, How do you go about it? Many times we've looked at, one, who's the financier? Like the Lake Trikana wind power, we've realized that a lot of it is pension funds from Europe. Um, the Dutch funding, DFID, have also put in. So it's a lot of little, little monies that have come from different p persons. But then from the Den Danish p population, we realize it is pension funds. And so we're trying to find work with Danish civil society to be able to get them to ask the questions. Um, we have the Dutch. DFID, um, AFDB has come in, but mainly as some places it's around, again, it has been purported as public-private partnership with the Kenyan government giving a guarantee. The Kenyan government right now is, forgive my words, screwed up because they didn't look at the document. And right now, if the Kenyan government realizes that as it is, the wind farm cannot generate as much energy as it is because wind energy, if you look at it, is cyclic. So it has to, it's only certain times that that wind can actually be generated. Otherwise, if they thought about it, they would have done it in a circle to be able to constantly generate the energy. We don't have the consumption and the storage is a problem in the country. So we have generated power, but we don't have very good storage. So the wind in Loyangalani is generated at night, which is, we're not a 24-hour economy as such, so a lot of that energy will go to waste. The Kenyan government has realized it, but they cannot speak about it because if they try to cancel the agreement, they will pay the company. You said that uh, local communities are heavily affected by these projects, and you talked about the absence of consent and consultation. Are there ways or like models of to actually bring in the local population that the government can, or also the, the public-private partnerships can uh, you know, based on, or is you know, is that something that you bring up? Is there something? Is there models already existing? How would you, you know, what what would be your vision to to have the local population involved? I think one consultation is critical. Whether they, you know, they will agree or not, whether we use force, at least consultation is critical. But we all know that land is a natural capital, and and instead of the constant idea that the land within communities should be leased. Is always just always is the only thing that's thrown around, and so you lease land about 150,000 hectares um, at 300,000 Kenya shillings a year is a joke. Why don't take that land and say let's value the land and allow for communities to own shares in the companies? I think we can start to look at how do communities. So it's no longer pu public-private partnerships; it's community public-private partnership or producer public-private partnerships, where you actually get the owners of the land, the owners of the territories, to start to own shares within these companies and own and actually on the process of development. Because we see a situation where we keep saying public-private partnership, but it's very extractive. It really ignores the people where the development is happening. And so it is state, private, and, 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 and maybe financiers. And so we start to ask ourselves, who's, if you're saying it's for the public good, and then development, whose development is it? And until we want to address who the development belongs to, then we will be able to start to engage and bring in communities. But as, as, as it is, for as long as we keep excluding communities, then it is not their development. And the development is defined by somebody else. 
you already talked about the wind farm project, and you also argued in a paper that you wrote for the foundation that there is a risk in even otherwise progressive investment projects that tackle one of the most pressing issues in Africa and globally, namely climate change. So projects that are actually low carbon, that are green energy. You write there is a risk of injustice even in these renewable energy projects. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think one of the things that I think the initial green energy movement and the green energy push was all about was small decentralized projects. Unfortunately, within the continent, within Africa, we are still dealing with the main grid. It has to go to the grid. And so we keep focusing on mega projects. And so it doesn't really address the issue. So in the aspect of dealing with climate change, so it is air pollution, we, look, we forget that ecosystems are actually an injustice. When ecosystems are damaged, while we are trying to attain the whole you know, carbon levels, we start to forget that these projects are not in a vacuum. They are on territories. They are on territories that support livelihoods. And so we have to be able to really think around what are we trying, what is the outcome we are trying to get? Because then, so you have, yes, you know, I'm for green, green energy, I am for de dealing with climate change, but then with what livelihoods? So for me, the biggest part is until we can start to say, what also are the size projects? And we can see through the World Commission of Dams who, who basically were able to articulate that even while hydropower is green, there is a size that is actually manageable, that doesn't destroy livelihoods, that doesn't violate the rights of, of, of citizens. And so in this push, and I went back to the electric and the wind power, which the former UNEP uh, head kept saying, it's green, it's green, it's green. He didn't care about land has been lost, people's livelihoods have been affected. He just kept saying, it's green, it's the largest wind farm, it's the largest wind farm. And then the other part of it is, the old concept of a lot of these projects, again, not Africa-owned, brought in by people from the Silicon Valley and other places who come in and set up these projects, know about all these red credits that are being given on this other side. All, this red, all the money that is generated for, from carbon credits doesn't come to the citizens whose land has actually been taken. So it is then shared between state and the companies. And, and we're seeing this continued push where we're saying carbon credits, carbon credits, Tell me, if you can count how many communities have actually been able to benefit from carbon credits, and even those who benefit, what percentage of that do they get? Who has the information of the total amount of carbon credits generated? How much money has been given? It's a whole different question. So we are seeing a lot of this, people packaging themselves, coming to areas which were not initially disturbed. They were virgin lands. But then they come, create a package, brand it, give it visibility. They're the ones who get the carbon credits. So there's a whole injustice around this. Yet again, while they're getting the carbon credits, the communities have lost their lands. So it's a whole state of it. So while, yes, we are pushing for and saying we have to look at low carbon development, but then we are saying whose development is it again? How are the people engaged in it? And do they lose land? And who's compensating their loss of livelihoods? Yeah. Martin, you have written on Chinese investment in Africa. There is this ongoing discourse, I'd say, in Europe about how Chinese cooperation in Africa is all about business and European economic cooperation is very much concerned with good governments and human rights and related issues. How do you see that? Does this reflect realities on the ground when it comes to concrete investment projects? Um, Claudia, you are, you are asking me uh, a very difficult question here. Why difficult? Because you heard Carlos Lopez yesterday when he did his comparison. He compared Africa to China, and he explained why. All these things that are being said about China and uh, their new way of investing in Africa, their new colonialism, because in bracket, in Africa, is very sensitive because I want to look at it in another perspective, just with my eyes, not with my theoretical knowledge or whatever. 50 years ago, we started some kind of cooperation with um, our former colonial masters. Years went on, 
And after like 50 years, we saw nothing. When you look at the infrastructure map that Nancy was presenting, when you go to Africa, you don't know how to drive from Douala to Jamena. Neither do you know how to drive from Lagos to Mombasa. I'm saying this on purpose. I will tell you why. Some Africans know why I'm saying this. Yet when the Chinese came to Africa, after like a few weeks or a few months, you could see some of the things that they said they were coming for. So I'm using just my eyes. So my eyes tell me that it seems to us that when the Chinese come, you can see something. Maybe they also come to, to do their business, just like other people came to do their business. It's always about business. Carlos Lopez yesterday said that the investment that you are talking about, the investment that you are saying you are going to bring to Africa, you don't do it because you like Africa. You do it because you are going to make profit out of it. You do it because you have an interest. And this is fair. You need to take your pension fund somewhere, Nancy said it, and make money from it to pay back your people. Nancy, that's business. It is normal. But now, where do we stand, we as Africans? What is the stand that we, we should have? And I think that's the point. We should also try to find out where is our own interest. Ikal just said, from PPP to CPP, something like that. We, we need to add that C. When we add the C, then we can start telling people what are our needs and what are our expectations. And from there, we can negotiate the kind of investment that should come to Africa. So you see, I'm avoiding your question to bring the point because I think this is the point we should be discussing. What kind of investment do we need in Africa? And how do we get that forward? So it doesn't really depend on who is investing. It's all the same. It's just depending on like, how to go about it in the end. Absolutely. And I think that's what Nancy was trying to explain. We are in an interest game here. Because those who come with their money, they come because they want to serve their interests. Nancy, the map that you showed on the board here, with roads going along the coasts and trying to go and touch natural resources, I call that bee to honey infrastructure. That's the kind of infrastructure, infrastructure people would bring because they want the honey. Now, we the communities, we need to see how, while the bee go for the honey, we try to get something that we expect from whatever we need. So I think it is a negotiation game in which we too should take our responsibility. Yesterday someone asked, are we not part of the problem? I mean, we Africans, are we not part of the problem? I think this is a responsibility that we need to take and then build our negotiation approach on that. Related to this question of uh, different approaches to investment, there's also the question of different approaches to economic development in general. There seems to be a consensus among regional and international organizations, bilateral partners, private investors, on the need for a structural transformation of many African economies. However, the term structural transformation, of course, can mean many things. So ranging from predatory capitalism to a degrowth society centering on the well-being of everyone. So if you look at ongoing investment projects, what type of transformation do they indicate? From a CSO's point of view, what, what type of transformation is desirable? What do they indicate and what would you wish for? You see, Claudia, I'm smiling here because um, structural transformation reforms. All those big, big words that they come and tell us. Once again, it has nothing to do with our expectations as people from Africa. And this is where 
we should also look at the history. I want to bring back some, some history for you to see my point here. When we discuss the kind of infrastructure that we want, and I look at history, you can see that after independence in Africa, we've had a kind of infrastructure that has very much to do with white elephants. Africans in the whole know what I'm talking about. I mean, in the 70s, when the World Bank was supporting infrastructure to get to natural resources and then hope that the, the, the revenue that will, that, that will yield will go to the people, we completely failed because when we tried to put in place productive infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, what we did was white elephants. That is, the choices were never the good one. We have very wrong choices. Why the choices were wrong? Because they had nothing to do with the community expectations. Then we move to another stage of history when we got into the 90s and then changed the, the, the former approach of the 70s into something modern, still in the spirit of bee honey infrastructure, and then started having these uh, natural, I mean, natural resource infra ex uh, extraction uh, infrastructure. Yet again, we never took in consideration what the community's expectations are. So when you look at that history and you come now to the perspective of the new initiatives, like the initiative that we want to bring today, we heard yesterday about the, in, the investment compact with or for Africa. We heard about the Marshall Plan with or for Africa. Now, what should that target? This is the question. What should we target with that? The communities in Africa know what we should target. Africa, through its 2063 vision, seems to know what they expect from anything that looks like infrastructure. But do we really read the reference document? I am not sure, because when you look at the seven aspirations of the uh, 2063 African vision, if you look at it well and ask Africans to help you understand it, then you can start imagining what kind of infrastructure we need in Africa. And when you imagine it, maybe you can shape your own business. While you come for your profit, you shape your business to be in face with those aspirations. In a nutshell, what do the communities aspire for? Sorry? In, just in a nutshell, what do African communities aspire for? What do they wish for? You oh. said they know what they want. What is it, in a nutshell? Expectations. The expectations. I will tell you what I heard two years ago. I will tell you what I heard in Cameroon, and you can translate it into something that you hear in other countries. In, 20, in, in 2013, when we, we, we did these consultations on the post-2015 agenda, we heard people say, we want education. We want health. We want <coughs> safe environment. And we want employment. And they added, all of that we want should have a precondition. We need sustainable infrastructure for all of those to be implemented. We need good governance. And we also need all of that to be effective. We don't want you to come and build schools that we cannot use. We don't want you to come and build hospitals where we cannot get to. We want you to bring social infrastructures that are useful to our people. Even if you don't have as many schools as you think you should build, those that exist should really serve the purpose of educating our children. So you see, there is a notion of quality here. That is, you should bring quality to the kind of social service that you bring to the people. That's what communities want in Africa. Mm -hmm. Ikal and Martin, you're both from civil society organizations looking at investment projects that are for the most part 
decided upon, designed, run by politicians, business people. When it comes to the public discussion about investment and economic politics in general, however, civil society is quite often involved or at least decided. For example, there is the C20 engagement group within the G20. So I would like to quote someone who could not make it today, unfortunately, Gierke Tano of TW in Africa, who said that CSOs have the walk-on part and express their most likely contrarian idealistic views, and then the real pragmatists, officials and business people, come to deal with the real business. So how do you judge that? How is, like, what is your opinion on that? Has civil society currently more than a walk-on part when it comes to economic politics, when it comes to investment projects? OK. Icar, you want me to start? <laughs> we always pretend to involve the civil society. And that's the, I mean, that's the exercise that you see everywhere. Um, a plan will be designed, and then on the eve of the validation mission, I mean, the validation meeting, they will invite the civil society and to come and be part of the validation process. Or you would have a project. Yet again, I will cite an, an example, like the Church Camp Cameroon project. Then you hear the project is going to be implemented. You don't know where it started from. You don't even know where the idea came from. You don't know what's the purpose. And then in a huge meeting, they will, come, they will ask you to come and say something when they are finalizing. That's not involving the civil society. And involving the civil society should be about involving the people, I mean the beneficiaries of the project. When I, when I say civil society, I don't look at organizations. I try to find the people through a number of organizations that represent their interests. So I don't think the, the, the mechanisms that we have today really help us involve the people. Inclusion is not effective. Mm -hmm. Ikai, what's your point of view on it? Just before I get into that, I think the one thing that um, Martin didn't mention around aspirations is there's a song by a Kenyan musician, D may know him, uh, Giuliani, who says, it's not that we want things cheap. We want an environment that enables us to earn a living to then buy the, the things you sell. So it, it's that it's not only about providing; it's giving an enabling environment to earn a living. So if then you're importing things that are cheaper, if you're creating, if you're providing a, a, a subsidy that then does not allow the person to earn a living to purchase, is is, is the problem. But then going on to to what um, you asked, yesterday you had what Carlos said. I was laughing yesterday because when Carlos was with Uneka, he was a lot more diplomatic. Yesterday, it was nice watching him yesterday. Um, and, 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 and he said something very rightly. If a lot of these things, again, it's, it's a space that you're invited to. If it's a space that you are given, that is there, that is standard, then that's a different thing. But if it's an invitation, the first time you, you ask too many questions, you push too many buttons, then there is no um, there's a very high probability of you not being invited. And as Martin said, it's about the civic engagement. It's not about when the document is on the table, you start inviting me, because we have realized it's a check, it's a tick the box. It's, oh, they were there, tick the box. But if from the beginning the conversation involves clean, you know, inclusive civic engagement from the beginning, then that's what we, we would be looking for. Um, then again, we are, we are sort of trading in the middle because there's a saying that says, if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. So you then ask yourself, do I fight it from the beginning and be kicked out, so then I become on the menu, or do I just be able to diplomatically and be apolitical in a way that allows me to continuously be there and put them on check? It's a very thin line for civil society because we push, we push, we push, then you get thrown out completely, and that means that we are cooked as a citizenry. And so that's, that, for me, is, is, is where we are, and, and really saying, it's not about inviting civil society to the space. The space should be there 
for civic engagement. So it, within the framework, as, as, as Martin was saying, the framework does not allow for civic engagement from the beginning. And it, it basically provides for a few people who will not stir the pot too much to be brought on board and tick the box. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Ika. I think we can really relate to that also in the work of the foundation globally because we work with civil society partners and there's always this thin line of like how much do you push and you know, when do you push too far to be excluded from any type of decision making process. So Uwe, having listened, uh, listened to what has been said by Carl and Martin, what does this <coughs> imply for German foreign policy towards Africa? So are we on the right track when it comes to economic cooperation, investment politics? Or not at all. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your interesting description of the si situation. And now I'm supposed to s give a small summarize and a summary and uh, uh, answer your question. So it's going to be very difficult for me. So I switch to German, so it will be <laughs> easier for me. So if you have headphones, use them. <laughs> yeah, sind wir auf dem richtigen Weg, was unsere. Uh, are we on the right track? with our investments in Africa. I'm a member of the Green Party parliamentary group. And in our group, we criticize the initiatives that have come up worldwide. And the reasons have been made clear. Uh, there are not many questions about the local wishes. Nancy said uh, colonialism is continued in a smarter way than before the war where soldiers were sent there. Now we send lawyers and advisors who make contracts which bind people much more. When I look at this wind farm project at Lake Turkana, well, I'm way enthused as a green politician, renewable energy, there is wind, no carbon emissions, 360 turbines at an area of 165 square kilometers, but the problem was pointed out. There are people who currently make their living or made their living on the land. What was agreed with them? Did they had a chance to be involved? This is what I do not understand, because I don't think that these wind turbines will destroy the livelihood, but it is their land, and so they should benefit from it. And uh, before such a project uh, is implemented, the people have to be consulted. They have to get an explanation what it is all about. They need to get an opportunity to deal with the issue. So they also need consultation. But Africa has already ex also experienced extremely positive developments in the educational field. There is a lot of civil society in Africa. There are many experts in Africa dealing with these issues, and they can also ad give advice to the local population at Lake Torkana. So I could imagine that a reasonable result could have been reached. The uh, land is leased out. Why not by the local people now? The, uh, it is leased by the government, which I do not understand, and it is political nonsense because problems are created unnecessarily. But the question is who benefits from this development? Obviously, the power goes to the capital, to, to the industrial regions there to 
implement the project calculations were made, very optimistic ones. They said 360 uh, turbines and then a long uh, line to Nairobi. All this was involved and World Bank already said in 2012, if I'm uh, informed correctly, this calculation is completely wrong, so we withdraw. And it was a strategy. We explain it to them. We build everything, and everything will be financed by the uh, power price. So then the line was hived off. And now the Nairobi government funds this line, which is as expensive as the whole wind farm. And this makes it obvious that there must be a lot of corruption involved, because nobody is so stupid that they cannot calculate it. And those who suffer is are the local people. And this brings me to the plans. We push ahead in Europe the Marshall Plan, the compact with Africa, the internal investment plan called the Juncker Plan, I, uh, uh, the international uh, uh, world banks also wants to invest. Well, as Nancy said it, well, I come from Bavaria. I'm in Bavaria, we would say, well, we lavish funds on the country. And this is not correct. I mean, it has been our experience, and it's also the re uh, reason for the guiding principles of Rocky. Investments are necessary and reasonable, but under certain conditions, if this is not the case, they will be destructive for the country or enforce negative developments. In the best case, they keep up a poor status, like, for instance, in Bangladesh, the uh, textile industry uh, is a case in point. What do we expect of investments? Uh, there was talk about expectations. We have to know what the local people expect, but it was not differentiated enough uh, for me. I would like to have heard a bit more what the expectations are. Well, we theoretically can say, well, we have to expect that the local population benefits, that it, it leads to a development for the uh, common good, that it leads to tax income. And this income has to be uh, transparent. So transparency is required for the civil society and the local communities. There are many questions, but also responses. The SDGs were approved in 2015. I think this is a roadmap to be followed by all investments. SDG number 10 says that inequality must be reduced, inequality within the countries, but also between the countries. And the question is, in how far do our European investments serve the interests of the investors more than the local community? Nancy, Nancy said it very clearly. Mega projects are implemented. Investments are uh, supported to get uh, out the profit. Uh, profit in German is a horrible word, but I mean, it's it's just really uh, to benefit from profit. And my fear is that uh, they lead to the Washington Consens 2.0. This is a program, a program developed in the late 80s and the 90s. 
and it was to lead to a neoliberal investment boom. And the ideology behind is if the corporations are doing well, there will be a triple down effect and everybody will benefit. Uh, nobody talks about it any longer, but they do it nevertheless. And all these investment initiatives that are also uh, related to the migration flows go in this direction. There are billions and trillions of dollars available, and there are no other investment possibilities. So the African situation is ideal. Many uh, commodities and uh, land is available to uh, grow things the West needs. This is the fundamental criticism of these investment plans. And when we make investments, we have to live up to our global responsibility and make sure that they contribute to the common good. Thank you, Uwe. I think that more, more people understand English than German. Um, at this stage, I would like to open up for the audience for questions and comments on what has been said on the panel, also what has been said by Nancy. So if you needed just a little bit of time to think about what you actually wanted to ask or comment, please feel free to do so now. The floor is yours. Have we a Saal micro? Ah, wonderful. Oh, and please uh, briefly say your name and uh, to whom you address the question, if it's a specific question for someone. Thank you. I'm Ishi Gabbert. I'm a um, senior researcher at the um, Göttingen University and at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. And um, I'm also coordinating um, a network called Slams of the Future, which deals with changing land uses um, especially in agripastoralist territories in Eastern Africa. It's a large network of um, people f um, mostly also from uh, the respective region and different researchers, but also activists and so on. <coughs> I firstly want to thank you for this part of the panel um, and also for Nan Nancy's presentation because yesterday um, I was uncomfortable, I have to say. I was uncomfortable because of the generalizations. I know what Carlos was tr was w wanted to tell us, but exactly this, what you were doing now, is so important. Because um, what is happening on the ground? Who is profiting? Who is profiting? So when we talk about general numbers, who is profiting? And what I have to say, um, I do want to cite a, a friend who cannot be here from Ethiopia because um, I'm comparing several investments um, in Ethiopia for the past eight years in several sectors, and much of, his, of it is painful, to say the least. And it goes under the argument, it's going to benefit everybody sooner or later, it's going to trickle down. But after 10 years, we can say, and I have to be more negative than it was yesterday, it was not happening, and it's not happening. We have many failed investors investments. We have many people who um, don't benefit and actually are impoverished. I mean, if you could talk about the Gibe and sugar cane and so on, we have people who lost their livelihoods and have no replacement, uh, don't talk about compensation at all. And this is not uh, respective for Ethiopia. So um, what I want to say and to ask, there's the divide of the managers and the managed the people on the table and the people on the menu. And this divide is extreme still. And as an Ethiopian politician told me, it's painful for some people. It's going to be painful. You were asking about sweatshops, and I was not happy about the answer. Because, yeah, some people will have to pay, and they don't really benefit. But why not? There's extreme knowledge. And that's why I want to cite my friend. This is about schools, what he said. but. It's also saying something about agricultural knowledge, and I'm going to end then. What we want is good schools, 
that integrate the knowledge and respect that even the smallest of our children have so they can proudly and in good health combine it with the things we cannot teach them. What he's saying is we know not a lot, we want investments, but we want to participate and especially, and that's what our network focuses on, um, build on the existing knowledge. Don't bring all this knowledge and tell us what to do. And I'm really thankful for these interventions because, um, and that's the last point I make before I ask my question, we also have a security problem. I mean, many of you know the big master plans in Ethiopia led to um, the state of emergency, uh, emergencies in now. And it, res it happened after the attack on 68 investments and um, uh, factories in October last year. <coughs> and this was because people were not happy with the master plans. And as a security advisor, I always say, when people are so unhappy, it's also not going to be beneficial. So my question now is, this divide exists. And how about people, um, local populations, and the managers? And how it's going to be brought together? What are your, um, your suggestions? Because it has to happen, because if not, it's also a real security problem for many people. And it's going to not be painful, but also um, deadly for people. Thank you. Uh, it's good that you raised the issue with the Ethiopian protests um, because we don't hear a lot about them. And we had a uh, we had a, an event uh, in the end of April on protest movements in Africa, actually also arguing, and we we concluded that we hear a lot. We talk a lot about all these plans and initiatives, but what we don't hear is that massively people go on the streets and you know choose other means of of protesting, not very seldomly against investment projects as well. So there is this side, which we don't hear a lot about here. So please, yeah, uh, please be a, a little bit briefer with your questions. And uh, I will take uh, two or three of them and then give the word to the panel. Hello, my name is Elisa. I'm a journalist for the German magazine Public Forum, and I'll keep it brief. We heard a lot about what's going wrong. So my question, are there also best practice examples where the local communities are involved from the beginning on? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Eric Palvix, my name. I'm an IT entrepreneur, so uh, and I'm also working for a, uh, working with a civil society organization, Weed, which uh, does world economy stuff. Um, the I have a question to Uwe. Uh, basically, uh, we we had some discussions about people on the ground and their problems with with governments or of a state uh, inside, for example, Kenya or probably also Cameroon. Uh, what uh, on the other hand, European politics <coughs> is uh, exclusively more, more or less exclusively going through the states. Uh, are there any uh, useful initiatives uh, to also cooperate with civil society organizations in Africa? One more question. Yes, please. My name is Yatin Shah. I'm a medical doctor. And I want to ask uh, Ikal and Martin, what is your view? What do you think is the way to good governance in Africa? How can the communities participate in the pro political process? And um, that not mostly the problem is somebody is going to Africa, he wants to invest something. He is not coming in touch with the local people, he's talking to the people with power. But these people of power, they have an own agenda or they are not linked to the local people. And what is your perspective on this issue? Thanks. Thank you. So we have four questions. First, uh, the divide of manager and local populations. How can we bridge that? Is there a means of bringing them together? Then best practices of community involvement and investment projects. Um, how can we cooperate, actually, other initiatives to cooperate directly with civil society organizations? And what about good governance um, and the power divide locally and, and, and nationally? So maybe, Carl, start with whatever question you want to pick. Okay, 
Thank you. First, before I get to the questions, I think for me it was most interesting because Uwe um, knew, I mean, the sense of someone outside understanding more about issues on the continent and within Kenya, it was impressive that he knew more than the German embassy in Nairobi. So when he came to Nairobi, the person who was, who was bringing him to Turkana was asking me, how come we don't know what's going on here? So it was very impressive. Um, that he was actually very un, you know, informed about the issues more than the embassy. Um, so thank you very much. Um, on the divide, I think it's not, there's no one solution to it. The reality is we're not homogeneous, even within communities, we're not homogeneous. And, and, and even within those communities, you will find that person is the one person who's going to sell the idea of there is land here, there is this there. And so the politicians are a part of it. The Ethiopian situation is one that is, it has many aspects to it. The fact that land is owned by the government. And so there are various aspects to it. There are various issues that even if I am Ethiopian by birth and I leave the country and get married outside and give birth to a child outside, that child will never own anything that I leave behind. So there's all those various things that Ethiopia itself just is dealing with. And to be very sincere, has to deal with from within Ethiopia. Because Ethiopians have never known to live in a vacuum, to the extent that when Meles Zanawi died, it took two weeks for the citizens to know because they were afraid that Ethiopia cannot be in a vacuum. So to be very sincere, while it is sad that the Oromo protests are happening, they need to happen. They just need to happen because Ethiopia has always been ruled by somebody. And so until they themselves, for me it's even, really good that they're standing up because they have never stood up. And every time they've tried to stand up, they've been put down. And for the first time last year, somebody ran number two in the marathon and showed a sign that was against all international regulations, but it raised issues around Ethiopia. For the first time last year, BBC was covering Ethiopia. It's never been covered. So it needed to happen for them, people to see it. That right now, we used to ask the State Department in the US, with all the things happening in, America, in, in Ethiopia, why do you still give them money? With DFID being questioned around the villagization process, why are you still giving Ethiopia money? With all those things, why are you still giving Ethiopia money? And then you claim all the other things. But the issue was, it's a security issue. It is a strategic position for the interests in the West. So the Ethiopia situation is a lot of things. So it's not only a divide, it's not about managers and managed. It's, it's around one, the citizens, if you look at the, even the Ethiopian political representation, it's only one, one opposition leader. If they four, five, then four, three will go to jail. So it is a process that needs to happen that's beyond resources, beyond a lot of things. And, 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 and yes, I, I agree with you. But also it is something that we in the Yomo Valley are asking that there need to be a lot of more social infrastructure because we can't, from the outside, keep supporting the, the local communities within the Yomo Valley because we need more of them to go to school more of them to come back and be able to, uh, to be in positions that they can represent the community's voices. And now it's nice to see the Konzo who are in the military, who are actually stripping off their military uniform and saying, I can no longer represent a, a state that doesn't even have the concerns of the local communities where I come from. So it is processes that are happening. And I think for what we can all do is support these processes. And we know that money cannot go into Ethiopia, but money can go anywhere you want it to go. <laughs> money can go anywhere you want it to go. A lot of the donors keep saying, we can't take money to Ethiopia. Oh yes, you can take money to Ethiopia if you want to take money to Ethiopia. You just have to decide that you want to take money to Ethiopia and support the Ethiopian population. Because we do take money to the government, so why not? On, on the aspects of um, governance, I think there's a lot of, again, it's, it's, it's one, a lot of investors, a lot of support goes into supporting institutions, the investment institutions. There's the, like here, there's the Nigeria Economic Summit. The investment opportunity, the institutions that are there, their position, government always has them. And they say, we are, we are standing here, private sector come together, there's a private sector aspect. There are a lot of institutions that are there in terms of, that you can actually use to get in. It's strengthening this. A lot of money comes in and say, we are strengthening governments. What is governments? when we are saying we're strengthening governments. There's a lot of resources that are put in for strengthening governments. What are we strengthening in governments? The institutions. How are we strengthening these institutions? Um, political participation. Unfortunately, and I was, I've been 
getting ranting about this from the beginning of the year. I don't know if HBF do money work on elections, but then you know, when people start saying good governance, it's, it is a process that is beyond the electoral process, the electoral year. And so everyone puts money, like right now I tell you for free, Kenya has billions of dollars being poured into Kenya for elections. Elections started four years ago. We're just going to actually have the date this year. And yet people will put the money this year. And we want it to be used. So it's thinking around how do you s support the processes before, like Carlos said yesterday. If you don't have data, if you don't have the systems that look at the person from birth to death, then you have a lot of dead people who actually voted during the elections because we don't have the records of when they died, if they died, and if they're voting. And we will count them in. So it's trying to remove the system. It's trying to work towards this. And it's really asking ourselves, when we are putting all this money and all the support in governance structures, what is the change we are looking for? Are we looking for a uh, log frame being filled and ticked the box that we supported Africa, there were this many people who attended, there were this many youth who attended, there were this many dis disabled people who attended? Is that it? Are we looking for real change within the continent? So I think for me it is really, really thinking beyond just the quick fixes that we've been looking for. Unfortunately, there is uh, strategic plans for most supporters, most is, is five years. And so we then go with that. But I think this process has to go really looking at beyond the five-year plans that we tend to put together. Martin. Uh, thank you very much for the questions, right? Because uh, that allows me to touch some of the points that I didn't touch. I think about the solutions even including the de dealing with the divide. He said it, the solution, the 2030 agenda is the beginning of a solution. Because you can see with me that the 2030 agenda was adopted in a different spirit. And even if the intentions were not always good. I don't care. But the way the agenda is shaped now, what you can read in the agenda, there are some of the things in the agenda which, which can help us start dealing with these issues. I will take the monitoring system. What the agenda says is that we should make sure that we contextualize, we domesticate. And we, when we domesticate, we should also ensure that there is a stream that brings back information to the high-level clinical forum. Now, it is the way you do this which can help you get to a solution. What am I talking about? I am talking about the possibility of a monitoring, review, and accountability framework designed in such a way that you implement it from the grassroots. Then, in your contextualization process of the SDGs, you make sure that that accountability framework is then interconnected to this complex evaluation framework that we have with 169 indicators and, 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 and so on. So if, if you could go to the grassroots, imagine simple indicators where people can have their say in what they want and how they want it and have it as an official framework in your country. Then, by so doing, you can have a process whereby the communities can come on board and be part of the decision making. I think that's a possibility. It can be done anywhere. We are trying that in our country now, because we are now having what we call regionalization of the SDGs, and we are going to communities to find out with them. How will they be able to assess that we are moving toward achieving the goals in their own perspective? And then we are, from there, we are, we are going to build what we call local, local indicators which will then help us connect to the global agenda. If that can be done for monitoring, 
it can also be done for designing project. I mean, the project that investment are coming for, we need to have official framework that at the grassroots level are able to bring in people to give, to give their say on the kind of investment that we should bring in. Not that we define it long before, but we should, in all of the cases, be specific and bring the people for those cases to say what they want and how they want it. And this should be an official frame. So I think that's, 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 that's part of the solution of what you are asking. If we do that, then we begin something. If we look at that, when we, when we implement the compact and the, and the Marshall Plan, I don't like those words, but they are there, we can use them. Well, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we do that, then we can get to something which is useful for the people. Thank you, Uwe. The question of cooperation between our government and CSOs directly, or the Green Party and CSOs. Yeah, also weniger die Grüne Party, sondern mehr die. Uh, well, it's official development uh, cooperation here. Yeah. Well. Uh, there is a state agreement between government and the other uh, governments, uh, so there's lots uh, agreed. Not all the money goes to the state. Many uh, uh, NGOs are directly uh, um, uh, funded and supported. That's implemented. Miserio, Brot für die Welt, they have a lump sum uh, budget where uh, the government is not interfering how this is spent. And Brot für die Welt also works uh, on the ground with NGOs. They are not just having their own projects, but also support local projects. And of course, it is possible that uh, through uh, state funding, well, somebody is going to distribute this, whether it's a GS, a GIZ or the KFW, it's possible to work together with local uh, uh, projects. I've seen wonderful projects in Sierra Leone uh, Liberia on, for example, circumcision here, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, genital mutilation here, and uh, and that's uh, you know that's NGOs that are on the ground and know the situation on the ground. So they have um, had this funding for many many years. The sub problem uh, supporting these NGOs is that these uh, projects are uh, termed three years. That's frequently too short, but frequently it's just cut and, and one moves to another area, which is a shame because many of these projects are very meaningful uh, and, um, and should be continued. And more I can't say. Uh, but I have a question to you. Can, am I also allowed to ask something? <laughs> yes, well, we'll have a last round. Uh, 20 seconds per question. Now you can raise it. Decision programs uh, and Kenya has uh, created a new uh, what is it called for Fassung uh, basic law constitution. constitution yeah and it strengthens uh, the regional areas is this not a part uh, to a good way to get rid of the corruption in your country or is it the beginning of it thank you so we have one more question by Nancy anybody else who wants to ask a very very short question is Uzu and back there Oh, that's too much. I think I take three, and then we have the, the, the time to, to discuss this further on in the, in the break. So Nancy, and then Uzu, I'm in the back, please. I actually wanted to respond to a couple of comments on uh, security and on uh, governance with a very specific example. Um, the many public-private partnership contracts have a provision that if there are strikes, uh, labor union strikes, or uh, protests, or demonstrations that delay um, a project, then the government the host government has to pay the investor. So m some governments will say, oh, you know, I really don't want to pay the investor. And so I'll just send the military out to squash the strike or the protest. And so we have increasing 
repression of civil society going on. And this is a point I just wanted to make because if we call for good, good governance, sometimes it's essential to know what the obstacles to good governance are in order to achieve it. And certainly these contract contracts that are like the meat in the sandwich or the vegetable in the sandwich, there's the state and there's the corporation and in between there's the contract. And many of these contracts also encourage investor to state dispute mechanisms so that a foreign corporation can sue the government because, ah, we're not giving in, getting enough revenues, you know, there aren't enough people traveling on our roads or going to our schools, and so we can sue you, whereas a domestic provider of services cannot sue their own government. You know, so the contract is like an investment agreement that gives many rights to the investor, and that's why we need a movement for all kinds of transparency, especially contract transparency. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Nancy. Please, go ahead. <laughs> you want to get up. <laughs> uh, OK, so we do yes. this Hi. the other way um, Mila Gesseli, I don't represent any organization. But I just wanted to hear a couple of thoughts about um, the recent free trade agreements between EU and the African countries, which apparently EU was really forcing and pushing. So um, in this sense, like what do, where's the point for these all investment projects or development projects if these free trade agreements destroy the livelihoods in the base in the first place? Thanks. Okay, thank you. One last question, Uzu, please, in the second row, the second row. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. And the last speakers you know, touched on it a little bit. I think the reason why we are here is because we want to see a shift in the way um, the West and deals with Africa in transactions. And many of these issues that we're talking about is as, as a result of the mindset that the West seems to have and is reluctant to shift from. And we in Africa have a responsibility to uh, build our own interrelationships and come to the table with, you know, strong. We have something to offer, which is a transaction. And in that transaction, it should be fair. So the last speaker talked about the EPA, which I just wanted to say, does not represent that thinking. It is just typical of the complaints that we have. Here is an agreement that we are expected to sign without negotiating. That does not speak to the fact that the West is willing to change its approach to the way it deals with Africa. And this is what will continue to affect development in Africa. Thank you, Uzo. So part of the free trade agreement question has already been taken up by Uzo. So we have the question about devolution in Kenya. Did it change anything? And if you have these free trade agreements, do we need to talk about anything else at all, or is this just screwing everything up? And please, let's have a last round of very quick comments on either these questions or anything else you want to point to for the last round of the panel. So I start to my right, and then you go. Claudia, you keep starting with me. The, f the free trade agreement, that's the kind of business you should not do when you are somewhere and you have the liberty to do what you want to do. Because there's nothing good in the free trade agreement for Africa. And even those who brought the free trade, ag trade agre agreement acknowledged there was nothing good in it. Because one of the clauses of the free trade agreement was that we shall be supporting you for the consequences of the agreement that you are going to sign. So there was something wrong with the free trade agreement. So that's my comment about the free trade agreement. And an issue with the free trade agreement is the same as the one that we are pointing out here about the, the agreement not having anything to do with what the people want. 
you would see that in many countries, even countries that signed the agreement, my country did sign the agreement. Even in those countries, the people did not want the agreement. And in many countries, people are resisting. So there's nothing good with a free trade agreement. Not good for us Africans, but good for those who are bringing the, 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 the free trade agreement. Indeed, I think they have something good in it. And once again, when we, when we want to sit on the table to do things, we need to at least agree on how we serve our interests. That is, you serve your own a little bit, and I serve my own. That is missing in the free trade agreement. Now, how the investment that are coming, it has been touched the point of, on, on, the compact, on the investment compact, which apparently doesn't touch the aspect of trade, for instance. I assume that, I, I, I think they assume that when, when the investment come, that will trigger trade and so on. It, can, it cannot be done by, I mean, by a, an invisible hand. If we, we want to do things effectively here, when we bring the investment and we think that that can trigger trade, then we need some level of regulation. I mean, to, be, to rationalize the whole system and make sure that as we go on investing, we are going to make profit. Africans are going to find their share of social services. And in the end, the continent will get some benefit. Where we get our benefit. So I think it's about the way we negotiate. We should fair, we'll be fair in the kind of negotiation that we want to have uh, concerning the, the investment in Africa. Thank you. Um. I'll not touch on that, but the one thing I know, when I was a little girl, my mother said, there's nothing for free, and very little for 100 shillings. That's, that's the mentor, that motto I go with every time someone says free, I say, uh-uh, there's nothing for free, and very little for 100 shillings. So when someone starts with a free trade, I ask myself, what's so free about it? So, um, on the issue of devolution, I mean, devolution is a really, it was a really good idea for Kenya. and. You can see its benefits, but the unfortunate thing is when you have a, a weak center, then it's very hard to devolve the structures. So when the central government is not yet functional, it has weak structures, it is stilling, and you haven't dealt with that aspect of the theft within the center, what has happened is we have devolved corruption 47 times. and so. Apart from devolving co corruption, we have increased the public debt because the wage bill is way too high. So we did not think about when you have a devolved structure, is it decentralized uh, social amenities or, or is it just too many offices? And so you have, imagine 47 times of a public government of 200 plus people who are earning a salary and so our public our wage bill is way too high and the because we have not yet really looked at systems, uh, procurement systems, patches, everything is not systemized. The aspect of corruption has increased 47 times. And yet you have an auditor general who, a brilliant guy, he was at the African Development Bank, who is actually able to question a third of the budget is missing, he's questioning um, the different counties, but he has a very small office of about 10 people, and every time he raises an issue, he's threatened by the parliament. So you have all these officers that ideally, really good people who are willing to say, it doesn't work, there's something wrong, there's something wrong with the budget, there's a miss in the budget, and yet, so he keeps getting, so we really have to think about what does devolution really mean? Is it just devolving, having 47 governors, or is it really thinking about getting systems to people and, and, and being able to allow people to get to, to different services. What Nancy said around the program for infrastructure development and the fact that it is African-owned, I think the problem is because we haven't thought about us and what we want sometimes, we get it thrown at us based on the IFIs are putting money in this, the IFIs are putting money in water, the IFIs are putting money in energy. And so we start to run around trying to fix, fit ourselves into where the money is being put into. And we really don't think about it. And yes, we can't run away from large infrastructure everywhere. But then, as long as the large infrastructure is not being linked to where the production is happening, where the farmers, so we're saying we're linking the East African power pool, we're linking uh, one part of the 
continent to another, but we're not really linking it to markets, to people. We're actually just taking from production in the minerals, but we're not looking at the agricultural production. Uh, we're not being able to look at transporting people. And so the transport network within the continent is extremely expensive. It's cheaper for me to come to, U to Europe than to go to Nigeria. And, 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 you know, and it's not addressing that. The systems that are being put, I mean, yesterday the president, our president, um, rolled out the SGR, the standard gauge railway. But then ideally, if you look at the first in instance everyone's talking about is goods moving. Yes, people will be there, but very soon over time, you find that we don't even ask ourselves all the large infrastructure that has been put in the continent since, why isn't it working? Then we come up and build new ones. So what happens to the old ones? So I think even while we're saying, yes, infrastructure is critical, but we need to ask ourselves, what happened to the old infrastructure? Why isn't it working? When did it stop working? Then we start new ones. And unfortunately, if you look at the new ones comparatively, you get our price of infrastructure is three times higher than the neighboring country. And you ask yourself, you know, if, you know, all the time we, are, we keep asking, what is going on? Because we, our, our railway is three times more expensive than Ethiopia's. And, and we will celebrate it, but then at the end of the day, because we don't want to have these discussions, because we're celebrating this infrastructure, then my grandchildren's children will be paying for something that probably by that time will not be working. So that's, that's the problem we're having around the large infrastructure debate. Yeah, thank you, Shun. Also, three points. Swinging. Als I, when I talked about NGOs, we have the situation that in many African uh, uh, countries, civil society is restricted. Ethiopia is very brutal, Eritrea as well, but there's other countries where the government uh, have um, um, uh, uh, are more anxious regarding the NGOs and try to restrict their activities. I haven't found a panacea and found a solution. Yeah, as was uh, mentioned, uh, since, since I've been in the Bundestag, uh, we have been criticizing all these EPAs. Everything that was said here is correct, but uh, uh, under the aspect of development, this has to be assessed. These EPAs uh, block um, reasonable development rather than support it. And uh, when we uh, link that then to Compaq and Marshall Plan, and always say, yeah, development of Africa first. What is um, uh, happening is EPAS, and they do the exact opposite. And if you want to know who's responsible for that in Germany, it is our development minister who is leading in Brussels, uh, uh, negotiating these contracts for Germany. It wasn't even in the GIZ, and wasn't in the Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation. But, but they should all know that, because Müller uh, um, roams the streets saying how bad these uh, free trade agreements are. At the same time, he signs the EPAS, and that needs to be communicated. And the last point is the SDGs, the SGEs define every country as a developing country i.e., everybody has to take their share of responsibility. We have to take our share of responsibility in Germany, check how our activities, investment uh, um, activities uh, affect uh, uh, developing countries, and also um, Africa has a lot to do. Corruption needs to be fought. Um, more measures have to be uh, uh, taken in order to upgrade infrastructure. There has to be cooperation at the UN level in order uh, for tax evasion to be more easily fought. So we're all uh, called upon to do more. Panelists, for sharing your important insights with us today. <laughs> for a very rich discussion. Thanks for your questions and comments. Very briefly at this point, I want to bring your attention to the fact that, of course, there's not only this conference today and yesterday, but we're going to have a range of contributions on our website on the topic of investment, interviews, articles, videos, graphics, and so on and so forth on the topic of the, this conference. On the G20, we have a huge dossier on the G20 already online. And also, for those of you who are interested in what has been said about protest movements, there's going to be a range of contributions also from the event we had in the end of April, Africa Uprising, about protest movements in Africa. 
We're gonna have a 15 minutes break now, and afterwards I'm very excited to welcome two brilliant and very controversial intellectuals, David and Dee and Ludger Schuknecht, in a conversation. So see you in a bit here in this room. <laughs>